so I finished my buckskin shirt. Um, <laughs> I'd have to check the calendar, but I don't know. I, I would say that I've probably been working on it for probably like two weeks every day. Um, usually in the evening and at night. Sometimes a little bit every day, sometimes a lot. It would just depend. So, you know, long time. <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I'll show you guys. Show you guys my shirt. Uh, on a flower pot. Hold on. Kind of a vest shirt. Da -da -da, da -da -da -da. Um, pretty happy with it. <laughs> Some things that I'm especially happy about are, um, you know, I think I wanted to make a shirt that was something I could wear in public, <laughs> like when I'm actually working, like when I'm teaching and on plant walks and stuff. Um, you know, I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of wearing clothes in the hot summertime. Uh, I, just, I just think it's, it's, it's uh, asinine. Um, but you know, when I'm working in, like in society, like I wanted something that is a little civilized. Um, so Things I'm really happy with about it, for one, like, I love the deep armpits in all my garments, like, oh god, like, nice and low, because, like, I don't want to wash my garment every single time I wear it, like, when I get sweaty and stinky, and then it just feels claustrophobic when, like, oh, I got stuff under my armpits. I don't know, some of you guys who know, like, oh, I need lots of space for my armpits, I love that. It's comfortable, and I just feel like it worked out really well. I mean, it was a lot of planning and a lot of attention to it, but like, it's it's great for non-boob pop outage, which is important for me when I'm like <laughs> in the woods with people teaching. Um, so like, it's just hard. It's for me, which is for me really hard to do in shirts like most shirts that I would buy in cloth shirts like I'm just I might as well not be wearing anything so I was just really happy with how like this really just like hugs my body the like side twist thing I don't like it doesn't pop open with a side twist that's great um, so yeah and every little button Every little button was made with a piece of deer bone by hand, like the old slow way. <laughs> like, you know, I just use stones. I don't use like an electric Dremel or anything. So insane, incredible hours just in making the buttons. So, you know, it's just so much. So much labor, so much love, so much magic. I don't know, with, with garments, I mean I've been making garments for all my adult life. You know, when I was a teenager and in my early 20s, it, obviously it wasn't animal hides, it was cloth. A lot of it on like antique hand crank sewing machines, every once in a while an electric sewing machine. And, uh, like, not using patterns, making up my own stuff. So, I've made a lot of garments. <laughs> and, um, like, I know, you know... It's almost like, to me, building a garment is like building a house. Um, it's just like, you just, like, it's like you put a brick down, and you put another brick down, and you take the next step. And as long as you just put in the time every day, like, if I just make myself touch that garment every day even if it's like I'm just putting in one button or I'm just stitching this much length of stitch and that's it like I can just get myself to it and get my hands on it then there's continuity and you know it's like a you know someone might see a garment like this 
you know, and just be like, oh, great, you know, cool shirt, cool shirt, leather, you make that, you know, and it's like the reality is, okay, so this hide, it's amazing, look how many hides are in my life, I remember the story for pretty much every one of them, and I remember, like, I moved out of Baltimore, the first time I moved out of Baltimore, it's 2016, early 2016, I left a bunch of hides, I left stuff, I remember I came back for a visit while traveling in like that same autumn, so I think it, yeah I think that's right, like autumn of 2016, um, I went back up there and I think that's when like this hide and maybe one or two or three others that were like halfway done and dried. I probably picked them up again, maybe, unless it was the year after that I got this one again. So I can't even remember, like, who originally scraped it. Um, I carried it around with another dried hide or two for, like, another two years at least, as I'm, like, traveling around and have my car just packed with all my stuff and eventually pulled it back out. I think it was summertime. I was at Chestnut Hill in North in the North Carolina mountains, and I remember I had it on a shelf, my little cabin there, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna finish this. So I think that was like 2018. Pulled it back out, dressed it and softened it, and smoked it. So I finished it <laughs> after it had been, it even like ripped in half. It was a tiny hide. It was so thin. Maybe it had mold. I don't know. It just wasn't so strong. Um, finished it. It softened so easily. It was so supple. It was just small and thin and lovely. Um, it's one of the only deer hides that I've softened by hand on a paddle instead of stringing. I usually have to string deer hides into a big frame so I can just use my body weight more with a paddle to soften it. Otherwise I get too tuckered out. I just softened it on a mistake on my softening paddle um, and then and I, with along with a couple other you know buckskins I carried this around <laughs> for another couple years in my hide bags not knowing what it wanted to be I think knowing that it wanted to be a shirt um, but I was holding out because I wanted it to be purple or blue because I'd been holding out on blue and purple particularly purple buckskins for like four years now experimenting with lichen dyes in urine, aged ammonia urine. It's four years in the making. I'm starting to have some success, but overall not enough not enough success to be able to tan, to dye a whole deer hide or anything significant. I have like one jar right now that's a success. And like one, two, three, four, five, six other jars that are not, nothing's happening. So yeah, so then I pulled this hide out maybe about two weeks ago and uh, just started making a pattern um, that I wanted and decided just like okay like purple isn't happening yet <laughs> I'll just do <laughs> we'll do my beloved brown um, walnut dye and I don't know it's funny like I like I've mentioned before, like I really, I didn't make any buckskin garments for, I think 2016, summer 2016, or spring, it was the last time I, the last time I made a buckskin garment, and it was a, a shirt also. I haven't made any new buckskin garments or worn any since then. It was my big break from buckskin, and. You know, when I was down in Western North Carolina um, over some years, you know, I got to see a lot of the buckskin garments that people were wearing and making down there, which, um, I don't know, like the style or the culture down there, they're very, they tend, you know, overall, tend to be like very tailored, um, densely stitched garments um, with a lot of like really ornate stitching and decorative stitching and people combining buckskin and vegetable tan, deer leather, bark tan. So it'd be like a shirt with uh, brain tanned 
a deer hide, and then like an accent pieces of leather that are like a dark, dark brown, shiny green, bark tan. Um, so very decorative, very highly tailored, um, dense stitching, lots of different fancy stitches. It was really different for me to see. Um, to be honest, like I, I really appreciated it. I learned, <laughs> like, <laughs> thank God, charity, um, you know, the three hours that I spent some years ago learning how to stitch properly from charity, like, <laughs> thank God, <laughs> like, revolutionized my ability to um, uh, be a more conscientious stitcher instead of just doing it all freehand, my leather stitching, doing it all freehand, and my little stitching was good, like, it was beautiful, it had a lot of personality. Um, so since then, you know, I've been kind of playing around with these more careful stitches and everything's a quarter inch apart and using a ruler and um, you know like all this work and and it's the same way I've been in uh, sewing furs like my, my um, rabbit fur winter garment was sewn that way like with just very careful stitching all with buckskin thong this is also sewn with buckskin thong which is pretty much all I sew with because I, I just feel like it's strong. It's slow. It's a very slow type of stitching. But I feel like it's strong, the strongest, and the most sensible. Because unlike using sinew or any other type of thread, the buckskin thong has the same stretchiness and quality as the buckskin garment pieces. So they move together, they stretch together, um, they just kind of meld and wed together. So I was just going to make like a simple, like I just want like a simple best shirt, something that I usually wear anyway. I'm not going to make it all fancy, you know, and then lo and behold, through any process, I sometimes have a vision of something I'm going to create and then over the process of doing it, it ends up transforming and there's a million, a million different avenue, uh, forks in the road of decision, decisions to make with a garment. Like, honestly, in this, you know, there's just a million... A million decisions just in this garment. I'm like, okay, I'm doing this stitch now, and then should I tighten the stitches here or loosen them here? Because buckskin is it's more like clay than like fabric. It's very movable, and you can really mold it um, with how if you tighten your stitches or loosen them. And um, you know, the buckskin like oh, it, the buckskin moved a little bit. It expanded on just this one side from my pattern, so do I do I cut off that quarter inch or do I leave it? Um, what kind of stitch do I want to do here? Um, it just it's just like a million decisions like that. Like oh, there's a crinkle. Do I cut that out? Like it's just um, it's just like a long journey of process making any garment for me. And this one um, was certainly that way. Um, they're very happy with it overall, but it's funny to me that in the end, like, most people might look at this and think, oh yeah, it's just like a simple woodsy shirt, and to me, I'm like, oh, it's so fancy, like, it's so tailored, and it has all these fancy stitches. I don't actually know what the stitch is. I don't know if I made it up. I saw some, a stitch similar to that in, like, a hand sewing guide, this one, and I kind of translated it into leather. It's kind of cool. It's much fancier than I would usually do. Um, we got like the French twist going on, a lot of these edges, this, I call this the snake, <laughs> snake stitch, but some people call it the baseball stitch. I like that one a lot. It's, I wanted to do the whole garment with just that stitch because it's so, it's the easiest to do, it's fast and it's strong. Got that one on the sides too. It's a good one, but then I ended up getting some other stitches. Um... What else do I want to say about it? Yeah, I don't know. Just, I want to ramble on forever, but. I don't know. Just me thinking about leather garment. I guess, I don't know. I guess if I wanted to talk about self worth a little bit, um, I have no idea if anyone else can relate to this, but. You know, I mean, I'm the kind of person that I think I've, I've swung between, probably as a child and a young person, I swung on the side of the spectrum of operating like I'm better than everyone else. Like, I came here from another planet. I am all-knowing. I, you know, I'm here to save the world. All you opinions. Um, and I think over the course of my 
young adulthood, like I did so much inner work and spiritual studies and healing art trainings and work with breath, you know, just years of breath work um, with a sangha and with a school and with a teacher and just devoted so much of myself to structured, group structured and personal inner work. And, you know, I think eventually got to a point where I felt really well-rounded and whole and full of, of a kind of authentic self-worth, um, of deep listening, of, of, of feeling my, my right place to be, you know, and just feeling powerful and beautiful in my own way in the world. And I think that over the last few years for me, um, you know, the last few years for me were just a parade of lacerating, there's no other word for it, just lacerating um, tragedies and traumas and griefs, um, just being like run over by the bus to the point where I, I didn't want to get back up again, you know, to the point, to a certain point that was very life-threatening for me. And, uh, you know, since then, I, I think I've experienced an, a lack of self-worth like I never have in my entire life. It's it's unusual for me, and it's it affects everything. It affects every aspect of my life every day. Um, but even before this stage for me, I think I've always had a little bit of this with the thing, especially with hides for some reason. I just have a lot of, the hides push my buttons a lot of ways and push my self-worth buttons enormously in ways I don't quite, haven't quite got figured out. There can definitely be this temptation for me, like, oh, like, oh, if I just make this next garment, you know, like this next thing, which is, sounds so amazing, and I've never made anything like that, and, um, like, oh, if I finally make that, then people will see it and think, like, I'll, I'll finally be in the big times, you know, like, I'll be a real hide tanner, or a real garment maker, I'll have more experience, like, no one will be able to mess with me after that, like, I'll just be Miss Hide Garment Person. And like, and then I like go on the journey and make a garment, and it's magical, and it's, you know, these these projects are usually a thing that string together one day to the next for me. You know, it's like, you know, whether it's in good times or bad times. Um, if sometimes if it's in really dark times, it's like the thing. Like, okay, it's something. It's an ongoing process that I can put my hands on, and it requires my brain, it requires my physical body, it requires problem solving, also artistry and creativity. It requires all the parts of me together to bring all those parts to it every single day. It's almost like it gives me a reason to, to live in really dark times. Um, and proof of progress. So like I was alive today, and alive the next day, because I can see the proof because like there's this many more stitches than there were the day before and where the the previous day I thought I was at an impasse with this garment I didn't know what to do I was frustrated I was tired I put it down which happens all the time and then the next day next evening I pick it up again and with fresh eyes and fresh energy I'm able to understand the solution to that problem and be like oh okay this is what I want to do and then I can keep moving forward um, and then I reach an impasse, and then the next day I pick it up again, and I'm able to come up with a creative solution to that impasse that I didn't have the energy for the day before. So, um, oh, what was I even saying that for? Uh, oh yeah, just that, you know, whenever I make a garment, I go on this beautiful journey, sometimes difficult, frustrating, takes... I learn a lot. Of course I learn with every garment that I make. I learn things with this garment. Um, sometimes I get my questions answered, sometimes they create new questions for me. Um, but by the time the garment's done, like, I finished this garment last night. By the time a garment's done, it's like, oh, it's just done. Like, now it's, now it's just a shirt. You know, like, for two weeks it was like this magical thing in my life. Um, this magical, secret, wonderful thing. It was just like being with the deer, being so with them um, 
every day, like in this dream with them. And then it's done. And then it's just a shirt. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, it's just a shirt. I can just wear it. It's going to get dirty. Put it my, you know, put it with my other clothes. Like, um, you know, it's not like, oh, now I've become a totally different person because I've made this next thing. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, what's the next thing I'm going to make? Like, <laughs> I need to make a new pair of shoes. Um, so it, I just say that to say, like, I know, rationally, I know that... Like, whatever I accomplish or think I want to accomplish, it's not going to take me to the next level or any new level. I'm just on my same journey, no matter what. So I can have a sense of humor about myself that way. Uh, I don't know. I think especially in earth skills communities and what in the past was called primitive skills communities and stuff like that. I don't know. I don't know that I want to get into that too much right now, but just like any community, like any human communities, no matter what, of shared interests or shared reason to be together, like, all, all fall into the same human problems that all human communities do, and the earth skills community is no different to me. And, yeah, especially in the Southeast, like, I just wasn't quite expecting that when I started to get involved in that community in, like, 2016. Um, like, I went to my first Earth Skills gathering. Like, I just had no idea that stuff existed. I had no idea there were, like, people that got together and shared crafts like this. Like, I was already a full-time, at the time we called it primitive skills teacher. I was a full-time primitive skills teacher, nature teacher, and I just had no idea that there were these gatherings. So I went down and started, it was the very beginning of when I started to get to know those communities. And, you know, encounter very wonderful things like any human community and encounter things that push my buttons too, you know, and specifically, I don't know, specifically in the Southeast for me, um, you know, I did notice some Maybe it was just, I was just feeling it more strongly because I, maybe I'm just predisposed to those insecurities in myself of not belonging. It's a big one for me. Like, there's no room for me here. I don't belong. Um, it's been a story since I was, like, in preschool. Um, but you know some, like, image competitive in there? Like, I say it jokingly because you all know it's true. Like, if you've been involved in these types of communities, you know it's true. Yeah, they show up in an Earth Skills gathering. And in a way, everyone's authentic and beautiful and loving. I mean, most people at least. Um, and wonderful people and funny and it's just like family and it's great to be around everybody. And then there's, of course, always elements of like mm, somebody rocking their new buckskin dress or like if you don't have your like hand forged knife in your handmade sheath of, you know, hemlock tan deer skin that you tanned yourself and like your coyote on your neck and then like you're, are you really cool enough. So, um, you know, I just think that's funny. I think it's, um, it's something that, I don't know, like, I gotta, uh, swallow it with a grain of salt. And, um, I guess I just say that to say, like, don't, don't worry about that. Like, if you, I don't know, if you're, like, trying to get into tanning or, um, like wanting to learn earth skillsy stuff um, and you encounter in any teachers or schools or communities if you encounter a vibe of um, exclusivity um, or skill shaming it's not across the board but there's a lot of skill shaming out there in those communities I notice of like oh you know, you better get with the program, and if you don't know how to make vinegar and mead and garden and forage and process roadkill and tan your own hides, then, like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Get on board. Like, um, look at all the cool shit I can do. It's subtle, and it can be subtle. Um, and clearly, whenever that is happening, I'm a believer that it's got to be born from other people's insecurities about self-worth or something else. Because in this culture... 
I mean, we're all just broken as fuck humans. Like, broken as fuck, broken from any lineage, broken from a deep sense of home, most of us. Like, oh my god. Like, I, I know it because I experienced it in myself. Like, my god. The feeling of lostness sometimes. And the agony of being in perhaps one of the most shallow and rift of heart and wisdom societies that has ever lived on the planet and you know I don't say that like as a dramatic you know dramatic or something it's, I'm saying it as, as the truth matter of fact so you know I just say that but try to get into tanning those types of things when you encounter if if you just feel like you don't, you don't belong, um, if you feel pressure to like be cool enough to fit in, and that difference between fitting in, or the pressure to try to fit in versus the experience of belonging. I think, what was it? Um, oh, what's her name? Renee Brown. Oh, she's got such great stuff on like the difference between fitting in versus belonging. It's been really something I think about over the years. Uh, but if you encounter that with a class or a teacher or a school or community, like just fuck it. Just like it's not worth it. Just walk away from that class. Like can you just like that's not for you. Like there's no like hazing involved or necessary to learn this stuff, to be a part of these worlds. Like fuck that shit. Fuck that. Um, there's plenty of ways to learn it. You learn it on your own. Learn it from other people. If you're ever in my class or listening to me and you feel like um, belittled or like, or even if it's just, even if, you know, you're learning anything or you're with some teacher and you just don't feel your heart singing inside. Like if you're not feeling a ringing sense of like, oh, this is, my, my spirit is singing being around this. If it's just like, eh, it's boring, or it's not clicking, like, it's not for you. Walk away. Look for something else. Um, and you, only you will know that. And so, like, if I'm not, if your spirit isn't singing when I'm talking to you, like, stop the video. Go do something else. I'm just not, not what you're supposed to be listening to. Uh, anyway, the sun's finally coming out again. Uh... Yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. On this garment, new questions that came up for me were things like tightness of stitching. Yeah, I just struggled with that a good bit more, especially like edging. You know, the first buckskin shirt I ever made, like most people's, I'm sure, like I didn't know you had to do edging. I didn't know buckskin would change shape so much the first time I washed the garment and got it wet. So like my neck you know, neck piece just like stretched out immensely and then I was like, oh crap, and then I had to stitch it after the fact to try to shrink it back together and like, you know, like most of us have learned those lessons. But even with this, like the subtlety of how loose or how tight to make the stitches really, really affects the shape of the garment and can increase or decrease the length of that panel, that piece of, of leather. Um, it's like subtle stuff, but I can get, you know, perfectionist about it. Um, stuff like that. Best way to like attach buttons and, cl and closures. There's just so many different ways to do it. Uh, yeah, I guess those are really the main, the main things. So not much, actually. Not much. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's it. I blabbed for a bunch. I'm excited for my shirt. Yay! I'll show you once again. It's a great shirt. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. I like the back too. I like it doesn't like it swoops down enough to be elegant, I think, but not too low. I just, you know. Pretty good, pretty good. I'm happy with it. I gotta finish some of these unfinished tattoos. <laughs>
do many projects. Uh, okay. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.